Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Internal Medicine Grand Rounds. It's my distinct pleasure this morning to introduce our speaker, uh, who I've known for quite a while, and uh, Dr. Dinesh Kaura. Uh, Dinesh comes to us uh, after uh, growing up in India. He did his internal medicine residency at Baylor and cardiology fellowship there as well. Um, he did some electrophysiology at University of Michigan before, before um, becoming an imager um, and doing advanced cardiac imaging at uh, Cornell. Uh, he's also uh, one of the multiple um, educated people that we have, uh, you know, we, we need more, uh, who are actually uh, has done an MBA as well. Uh, he's shown leadership in the imaging area, and he is the epitome of the five pillars, uh, a, a master clinician, a great educator, uh, as, and he does advocacy. And as you may know, he is a, um, the governor for the American College of Cardiology Kentucky chapter, a uh, great administrator uh, as he uh, using that MBA in information that he's gathered over the years. Uh, and he has been a very prolific researcher with hundreds of publications. Uh, and he, uh, when he came to me at Rush, wanting to, I said, you know, I should hire this guy, but I'm going to do a little background checking. And I saw Baylor on there and the guy who had been president two years uh, yeah, two years before me, Bill Zogby, I called him and he was just absolutely overflowing. He says, you got to hire this guy right away. He's, and so it, it all worked really well. The next came to Rush. He became I, what I was, uh, I coined the phrase, jack of all trades and master of all of them. <laughs> and uh, he, it, the, only, the only time he disappointed me was when he told me that he was coming here. Well, that turned out to not be a disappointment at all. <laughs> okay. So I, I really appreciate uh, all that you've done in your career and uh, and all the leadership that you've shown here, Dinesh, I'll say that publicly. And at this point, uh, I'll stop being so effusive and actually turn it over to you for uh, Grand Rounds on management of dyslipidemia in 2024. Thank you, Dr. Williams. That's a very kind introduction. And it's really been a pleasure working under your leadership and Dr. Williams is one of those people, uh, for those of you who know him well, he's really kind and giving. Uh, and he really cares about uh, the careers and the mental well-being and the success of um, all people that he mentors, young and old. Uh, I consider myself in the old category now, but he's been an immense force in my career. So thank you for that. <clears throat> so tonight, I am going to talk about management of dyslipidemia. And I got into the lipid space much when I got into the imaging space. And thankfully, a lot has changed over the past 10 years. And so I want to share some of those advances with you today. So as you know, uh, cardiovascular disease remains the number one cause of death uh, in the United States, both in men and women. Accounts for about one out of every three deaths, about half a million deaths a year from cardiovascular disease. And it overshadows deaths from cancer, as well as uh, lower respiratory disease combined, which sometimes get a little bit more attention. We've gotten so attuned or numb to the statistics from cardiovascular disease that sometimes I feel like we don't pay enough attention or there's not enough research dollars being shunted that way. Uh, so the statistics still are pretty grim. Uh, about 30 million Americans have CAD from the latest data. This is from 2022. The latest publication every year comes out in circulation uh, about statistics of cardiovascular disease. And every 40 seconds, we still have a person in the US uh, having an MI, and unfortunately, one third die before they reach the hospital because of ventricular arrhythmias or other complications. Um, and over the past five decades, we were doing a good job with management of cardiovascular disease, such that mortality was going down in both men and women, and that was largely because of primary PCI, control of better control of risk factors, uh, the campaign against smoking. But then you see in 2010, we have this inflection point where cardiovascular mortality has started to go back up. And that's because of, again, increasing rates of obesity, people are living longer, uh, there's more prevalence of diabetes. So much of the gains we were seeing now, unfortunately, have started going in the opposite direction. And one of the things you see contemporaneously with that is increase in rates of dyslipidemia. The red bars show you the percentage of people who have dyslipidemia. This is data from 2016. 
as compared to the blue bars, which is 2013. And you'll see there's a trend upwards in the wrong direction going on there. And the reason I mentioned that uh, dyslipidemia in the context of cardiovascular disease is because this is powerful data from Salim Youssef, pretty old now, two decades old. This got published in The Lancet, but you'll see it cited very often. It's called a study called Interheart. It's a very powerful study done in 52 countries across the globe. And the question was very simple. They took 15,000 patients who had had their first heart attack, and they compared their risk factor burden to 15,000 controls. And what they found was, if you looked at the people who had their first MI, 50% of the attributable burden came from dyslipidemia. So the prior slide I showed you, where dyslipidemia is going up and cardiovascular disease mortality was going up, has real bearing to the fact that dyslipidemia remains more important than some of the other risk factors for cardiovascular disease, such as smoking or diabetes or lack of exercise, or Dr. Williams will tell you, having an unhealthy diet, right? So if you, if you were unlucky enough to have all the nine risk factors, 90% of your risk of MI will be captured by those risk factors alone. So it's still important for us as clinicians to focus on the basics, focus on healthy lifestyles, but control of dyslipidemia, which is why I thought this topic would be particularly relevant to talk about today. So getting back to the basics, you know, when you're in med school, you're taught about the risk factors for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And so when we talk about associations versus causality, we know that in order to say something or some factor is causal, we need three or four lines of evidence to prove causality rather than mere association. For example, I could tell you finding yellow stains on a shirt is associated with MI. We say, okay, well, that makes sense, but what's the biological plausibility behind it? And you say, okay, well, people who smoke have yellow stains on their fingers and shirts. Okay, fine. So that, you, you're moving away from causality to association. So in order to prove causality, you need to have these three things. You need epidemiological data tying that risk factor to the disease. It's better if you have genetic and Mendelian association also proving that concept. Then you need to have biological plausibility, like I said. And then finally, you need randomized control data saying that if you control that risk factor, you actually bring down the incidence or prevalence of that disease. So off these risk factors for cardiovascular disease and the lipid space, which ones are causal for ASCVD? So I think all of us will agree that LDL is a very potent uh, causal risk factor. What has become clear over the past two decades, and we didn't know this, is we used to always think low HDL was causal, but low HDL is not causal. It is just associated. High triglycerides, again, are not causal. High LP little a, which we'll talk about in a little bit, uh, is actually causal, as are something called high triglyceride-rich rich lipoproteins, TRLs. And the TRLs, uh, are comprised of remnant particles. So these are chylomicron remnants, intermediate density lipoprotein, VLDL, that we don't often measure, but are captured in non-HDL. It's the cholesterol that those particles carry that is able to penetrate in the subendothelial space and produce atheroma. So uh, we'll talk about ApoB in a second, but PRLs are particles that have ApoB, and ApoB is essential for a particle to bind on guam to, uh, to the endothelium and put its cholesterol cargo into the arterial wall. And that's why these particles are important. So low HDL and high triglycerides exert their effects or they're associated with high levels of triglyceride rich lipoproteins. I'm sure you've all seen this. You have a diabetic with poorly controlled diabetes, they have low HDL, they have high triglycerides, but neither of those is directly contributing to the disease. It's the VLDL cholesterol that's uh, 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 circulating in their bloodstream that is causing atheroma. So um, uh, the title of this topic was uh, uh, case-based approach. So I thought I would intersperse my lecture with cases. So here's a case. I think this was actually sent to me by Dr. Krishnasamy. So 55-year-old white male, father had <clears throat> MI at age 52, so that qualifies for premature atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease in the family. He's a non-smoker. BMI is a little bit high. His waist is uh, up. 
<laughs> and uh, blood pressure is okay. So there's no history of hypertension not being treated. A1C is 5.6%. And how would you manage this patient for cardiovascular risk? So all of you would first obviously get a lipid profile. You see his lipid profile is not particularly remarkable aside from a low HDL, and he's not a smoker. Remember, smoking can reduce HDL, but this HDL would likely be because of metabolic syndrome, obesity, lack of exercise. And so you pull out your pooled cohort equation calculator and you plug in the numbers and you come up with a risk of 5.3% 10 year ASCVD risk. And now we have a new calculator called Prevent, which also includes heart failure and other things, but it's a little more granular. You've got to put in GFR if available, A1C you can, and also social determinants of health. So what do the guidelines tell us about somebody who has a borderline risk uh, between five and 7.5%? You may consider a statin, but here's a gentleman who has a family history. So there are something called risk enhancers that you can use to further inform your risk. So the two questions in front of us as clinicians are, does this patient qualify for statin use? Uh, and would you like to give them aspirin? And sometimes I like to get a little more information before giving uh, my uh, recommendations to the patient. So as most of you do here, we get a calcium score on this gentleman and he's got LAD calcification. Remember that if you're gonna round with Dr. Williams, every CT that's done, including non-contrast chest CTs, you gotta look at them because you will pick up these sort of incidental lomas, which are more impactful on why the patient will die rather than the other thing they got the CT for. So this is really powerful information that is sometimes ignored, but shouldn't be. So here you have somebody with a calcium score of 125 and check the other biomarkers. His CRP is slightly high. His LP little a is normal and his APOB levels are okay. So, there's a new calculator now. It's not that new, but if you use calcium scoring, you can actually plug in that refined data into this MESA calculator. And Dr. Umer has done a lot of work on this. In fact, he's done a lot of work on looking at disparities between people living on the West End or underrepresented minority populations getting calcium scores versus folks who are able to afford calcium scans, getting scores and showing the disparities actually translate to downstream testing and events. So, so you put this, these numbers again in the calculator, but this one actually allows you to put in the calcium score and gives you a more refined estimate. So now the estimate's gone up to 9.5%. So from 5.3%, you've upgraded his risk now to 9.5%, plus he's got risk enhancers, a family history, metabolic syndrome, and a high CRP. So here's the table for primary prevention and the cholesterol guidelines. You have family history, metabolic syndrome, CRP, elevated calcium score. Risk has now gone up. So your recommendations are gonna change. You're gonna be more aggressive with this patient. You're gonna obviously have them do lifestyle exercise, a plant-based diet, remove any red meat. And now you would strongly recommend a moderate intensity statin to reduce his cardiovascular disease risk to about 20%. And aspirin, yes, there's two guidelines that talk about aspirin in general. You know, then the fellows around with me, I'm like, why aspirin? People on Eliquis all the time and aspirin. And what's the need for aspirin? So aspirin has very narrow indications now. If your ACC guidelines say if you're between age 40 and 70 and you have a high ASCVD risk, and a low bleed risk, it'd be a class 2B indication. So you may consider it. And SCCT guidelines say if your calcium score is more than 100, then you can consider aspirin. So it's not a class one indication. The days of giving every middle-aged person you'll see in the clinic aspirin are long gone. Uh, the other thing we know, and the reason we are a big proponent of calcium scoring is if you look at the interplay between calcium and risk factors, it's not a good correlation. So for example, somebody can have zero risk factors and they can still have a 15% chance of having a calcium score more than 400. And there are folks who have more than three risk factors who sometimes have calcium scores of zero or calcium scores that are not very high. So 
the reason calcium scoring is so wonderful is because it's actually a window into the atherosclerotic progress uh, into process rather than looking at surrogate markers that lead to atherosclerosis. So it really informs your risk. And now this data exists for uh, way more than 25,000 patients, but this is the calcium arteries consortium showing that up to 12 years out, calcium score very well predicts not just cardiovascular death, but all-cause mortality. So if you have a calcium score that exceeds 1,000, your all-cause mortality is about 25% at 10 years out. So it's really powerful data suggesting the prognostic value of calcium. The other thing it does, it informs your management decision. So you have somebody with high calcium, it tells you when a statin can be useful. So if you see people with calcium scores of zero, a statin doesn't make any difference in their mortality. You start to get a separation of the curves if the calcium score is more than 100, and certainly more than four, above 400, you have a big decrement in the rate of cardiovascular uh, mortality and MI. So the flip side of this is, as I showed you, some people have a lot of risk factors, they're hesitant to take a statin, and their calcium score may be zero. And you say, well, how do I reconcile that? You can, because the, when the pooled cord equation recommends you give somebody a statin, 41% of times their calcium score will be zero. And we know that when your score is zero, your 10-year risk is so low that you don't deserve a statin. You're not gonna make much of a difference in terms of their outcomes by prescribing a statin. So the calcium score really helps adjudicate or refine risk. And so this is very powerful information that can also help de-risk a patient. And so that's reflected now in the guidelines that if you have somebody who's on the fence about, cal about taking a statin and they don't have smoking and they're not diabetic and they don't have a very strong family history, you can do a calcium score if it's zero, then you can wait five years until you check again uh, before you prescribe a step. So move on to another case. Uh, here's a 29 year old woman who was told at age five to have high cholesterol. And I applaud her physicians for checking it. She had a family history. You know, the uh, American Academy of Pediatrics recommends checking cholesterol in children, but the United States Preventive Task Force does not. They certainly do if you have a family history, but you know, myself and others in various cholesterol professional agencies, such as the NLA, strongly advocate for checking people uh, starting in childhood, especially if they have a family history. So this uh, uh, woman has a family history. She was started on atorvastatin at age 10. Uh, and when I saw her in April of two years ago, her LDL was still 280 on 20 milligrams of atorvastatin. And here's her lipid profile. Her HDL was okay. Triglycerides were okay. And so now she wants to know what else can I do to reduce cardiovascular risk? So I said, well, let's check your genetic profile and see what kind of mutation I'm dealing with. And we got a mutation in the LDL receptor gene, and she was heterozygous, i.e., of the two genes she has, one of the alleles on one of the genes was malfunctioning. And so her LDL receptor doesn't function properly. It can't mop up the LDL circulating in the bloodstream. So she has heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia. And you may be surprised to hear that the prevalence of that is not rare. It's one in 250. It's one of the most common monogenic cardiovascular inherited conditions. So, you know, if you look for it, you'll find it. Uh, homozygous, on the other hand, where both uh, alleles are malfunctioning, that's much rarer. So one in 600,000. So what do we do for her? We increase the dose of her atorvastatin, and we put her on a PCSK9 uh, inhibitor. And I checked her LP little a. And why do you check LP little a? Because uh, with a twist of fate and a bad direction, 30% of people who have FH also have a double whammy from having high LP little a. More than that, what you find in the general population, where it's about 15 to 20%. So uh, these folks are particularly unfortunate because both of those factors synergistically increase the risk of cardiovascular disease. So her LP little a was okay at 21 nanomoles per liter. We like it less than 50 nanomoles per liter. And her follow-up LDL cholesterol on a PCSK9 and high dose of statin came down to under 100, which is reasonable. Uh, and if you look at the statistics on LP little a, 
uh, I'm sorry, FH, heterozygous FH, as I said, is particularly common. So 30 million people across the world have it, and it increases the risk of ischemic heart disease tenfold, but particularly premature ischemic heart disease. So if you have a young person coming in at age 30 or 40 with an MI, the probability that they have an underlying diagnosis such as heterozygous FH or high LP little a goes up much further. Uh, we talked about mutations in some of the genes. So there's four major genes identified. The LDL receptor actually won the investigators the Nobel Prize back in the 80s. And this causes 90% of cases, but obviously other genes that control cholesterol metabolism, such as ApoB, PCSK9, and the LDL receptor associated protein can also be um, uh, culprits in this case. So why am I checking genetics if I already know what I'm gonna do? And that information came out of this slide, which is when you have people with uh, a particular level of LDL, say for example, they have an LDL of 200 and you have uh, someone without FH, their risk of odds ratio of coronary artery disease is elevated fivefold compared to the general population. But if they have a high LDL of 200 because they have FH, their risk is 17 fold higher. And you say, why is that? It's, you just said LDL is the particle that causes atherosclerosis. Well, think about when this process starts. When you have FH, the process starts in utero. So at age one and two, you're being exposed to very high levels of LDL. So we'll talk about this concept of just like pack years of smoking, pack cholesterol years of arterial exposure to LDL. So these folks have had high LDL since birth. So their risk of cardiovascular disease is much higher than a 45 year old who starts to develop high levels of LDL later in life. Now, it's not all gloom and doom because if you put these people on statins, their decrement in risk is far more than somebody who doesn't have FH. The higher the absolute risk, the more benefit you're getting from therapy in these folks. So that's powerful information. So it's important to screen, test for these people, look at their genetic profile, and that also allows you to test family members because if you have a proband, you've identified this patient had people in a family who had had it, but you identify the first individual, then you can test the entire family and keep them uh, in your clinic and start therapy as soon as they start having, uh, as soon as you detect that their cholesterol levels are high. Now, the physical exam findings are particularly relevant for residents. We always talk about uh, 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 tendinous xanthomas. And the first sign you will see for Achilles xanthomas is not actually uh, a proper xanthoma that's visible to, to the eye. You have to palpate the Achilles tendon and you'll notice that it's thick. So uh, do a few normal palpations, right? And then you'll be able to recognize what is thick and nodular in terms of uh, tendinous xanthoma. The other features, obviously, you're well aware of xanthelasmas. These are not very specific. They occur even in old age as just the arcus cornealis, but arcus cornealis in a young patient is very suggestive. And we talk about the tendinous and tuberous xanthomas. And now we have, uh, as I mentioned, there's been several drugs and pathways being investigated over the past two decades. You know, for 50 years, all we had was statins. Uh, and then about 20 years ago, we got azetamide, which blocks cholesterol absorption in the intestine. And now we have other drugs. So in, in her case, we had put on inclycerin, which is dosed every six months. So it was very convenient, which is what she wanted. But we have PCSK9 inhibitors that reduce LDL uh, cholesterol. And we'll talk a little bit about PCSK9 in a while. But PCSK9 inhibitors basically prevent the destruction of your LDL receptor. And then you may ask me, well, if these folks have no LDL receptor, how is a PCSK9 inhibitor going to help them? Because most people don't have a null uh, LDL receptor activity. They have some activity. Uh, and so that's why if you keep that receptor with 3% activity around, 
it's going to have some decrement in LDL. But if you use it for somebody who has a null, null mutation, a PCSK inhibitor would not be helpful. And that's where you have these other kind of drugs like NHPTL3 inhibitors, which I'll talk about in a second, which have benefit because they don't need the LDL receptor to work. You also have another drug called lomitopide, which is used infrequently. And then for severe cases of homozygous hypercholesterolemia, you actually bring them into the clinic and you uh, purify their blood by apheresis, remove the LDL particles by apheresis every two to four weeks. So this is what the new science uh, is showing. This is an exciting area of investigation. There's a protein made by a liver called angiopoietin-like 3. And angiopoietin-like 3 has multiple effects on lipid metabolism, but essentially what it does is it destroys or uh, inhibits the function of lipoprotein lipase. And lipoprotein lipase is one of those good guys who mops up and breaks down triglyceride, lowers your VLDL production, reduces LDL cholesterol. So NHPTL3 blocks LPL. And so if you block NHPTL3, you're going to get modification of the lipid profile in a good way. And so that's what this monoclonal antibody called evinacumab does. It's approved, FDA approved for treatment of homozygous hypercholesterolemia. I have a, one patient on it, but it's an intravenous infusion given every four weeks. So it's not super convenient. Hopefully there'll be a subcutaneous form uh, of this drug in the future. And then there's other drugs in development that uh, also target this molecule, uh, angiopoietin light -like 3. Uh, the uh, trial in New England Journal uh, uh, a few years ago showed that evinacumab was able to reduce LDL by about 50% uh, in patients with uh, FH. So there is now hope outside of apheresis for these people where they can even get off apheresis sometimes if they'll um, take some of these other drugs. Getting back to uh, basics of LDL, you know, we've known for about 40, 50 years now, this is data that you'll see in every lipid talk. This is the cholesterol trialist uh, uh, collaboration line that charts the benefit you get in uh, reduction in vascular events with reduction in LDL. And we've all been taught this, that for every two milligrams per deciliter, decrease, you create an LDL, you get a 1% less chance of major adverse cardiovascular events. And so that line is born true no matter how you reduce LDL, whether you reduce it by statins or in improve it as they did with uh, statin plus azetamide or use the PCSK9 inhibitor, et cetera. And I've shown you here several trials over the past uh, four decades that have shown that no matter where you start off with your baseline LDL, for example, in the forest study done in Scandinavia post-MI, the baseline LDLs were 188, and they brought them down to 111 using 40 milligrams of simvastatin. You had a 34% reduction in cardiovascular events. More contemporary era, uh, improve it. The baseline LDL is only 70, and you bring it down to 54, and you still see a benefit in cardiovascular reduction. Absolute reduction is small, but the relative reduction stays the same. And you, even if you drive down the LDL to 30, you're still seeing that benefit. So there is no floor as of yet we have identified where the, there's a plateau in benefit. So that's important information. So you treat aggressively in patients who are high risk and the decrement in cardiovascular events depends on where you start with the LDL and where you end up. And this is that concept of cholesterol years I'd mentioned a few minutes earlier, that the duration of exposure determines how much disease you're going to have. So you have somebody with severe FH, they have a lot of exposure, and they have a higher prevalence uh, of cardiovascular disease. If you have low LDL, either because of genetics or excellent lifestyle, you know, avoiding red meat and eating more plant-based uh, plant foods early on, getting exercise then uh, you will have a lower exposure years of LDL to your intima and get less cardiovascular disease. So this is an important concept and is especially important when you talk about primordial prevention, primary prevention. When you start looking for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease is important. There's now a concept going on where you start looking. The first place atherosclerosis appears is in the iliofemoral arteries not in the heart, not in the carotids, in the iliofemoral. So if you have an ultrasound, and this place is readily accessible by ultrasound, 
when the bioimage study is doing this, you look for plaque in, at age 20. And if you start seeing plaque, you start treating early. That's what we call primary prevention. Primordial prevention is obviously, you know, you start very, very early, but that would be primary prevention. First identification of plaque, you start treatment rather than waiting till age 50, which is currently mostly what we do. And by that time, you've lost 30 years of ability to make a dent in the progression of cardiovascular disease. The reason that's important is because we've now, <clears throat> this is firmly recognized now that when you look at LDL cholesterol levels in healthy populations, uh, you know, infants or uh, folks that uh, are, are tribes that live in the Amazon or in South America or, or even in Africa, their LDLs are between 30 and 40, hunter-gatherers, uh, folks who don't eat a lot of meat um, and Maybe we've been thinking about this wrong all along. Just because the average LDL of the U.S. population is 110 doesn't make it normal. Just because we used to think that blood pressures of 170 or 160 systolic were okay doesn't make that a healthy blood pressure. We know that for a large, lot of biomarkers that we see these days, we're, you know, the, the normal level for an LDL, optimal level, is about 30. Remember, there's a disconnect between blood LDL and intracellular LDL. So most folks think, well, the blood LDL is too low. How are my cells gonna function? How are my cells gonna make phospholipid bilayer cell membranes, uh, uh, steroid hormones, et cetera? Uh, there's plenty of LDL intracellularly. And the best evidence of that is when you have infants that are growing up where the brain is developing really fast, they're fine with an LDL of 35. And we've seen that with PCSK9, naturally occurring mutations in populations, they have healthy lives, able to reproduce, don't have any increased risk of cancers with LDLs down as low as 10. And so all of that's to say that we, we, we think we should be doing a better job uh, with control of LDLs in patients with ASCVD. So this is a large data set of three years ago, 5,000 patients with established cardiovascular disease if you look at the percentage of people with cardiovascular disease prescribed statins, that was good. But intensification of statins uh, after two years as needed to bring the LDLs down to below 100 or 70, that was quite poor. Uh, so 67% of people remained at LDLs more than 70. Some of this has to do with, uh, and I'll talk about that, why people are not at goal. Some of this has to do with people stop therapy. So one year out, 40, 50% will just stop the stand because it's not of immediate benefit. There's no perceptible immediate symptomatic gain. So people say, I got off of it. Um, so non-adherence is a problem. Uh, the second thing is some people actually need more than just a statin alone. Statins can reduce LDLs by 40, even 50%. But if you need more than that, you need a second drug. Some people genuinely have statin-associated myalgia. It's about 10% of people. Uh, and then others have all kinds of concerns. Dr. Google told me not to, or you know, they have some genetic background that causes less of a response, or they have high levels of LP little a. Remember that. If you see somebody in clinic who doesn't have an expected response to statin like you've seen, it's because the cholesterol carried by LP little a is not affected by statins. So if that cholesterol is still floating around, you will have less than an expected decrease in the LDL uh, on repeat testing. And you know that as you double the dose of your statin, you get a diminishing bang for your buck. So you've got only a 6% reduction in LDL when you go from 20 to 40 to 80 milligrams of atorvastatin, for example. But still, we push statins. And why do we push statins? Because it's not just the amount of LDL in the bloodstream that's penetrating the space. These are fantastic studies using intravascular ultrasound and NEARS, uh, near infrared spectroscopy to characterize plaque, looking at red plaque, which is vulnerable plaque, lots of lipid in it, versus green, which is fibrosis. Once you put people on statins, you passivate the plaque. So you get less lipid in the plaque, and you get more calcification, more fibrotic processes. So the plaque is healing, less likely to rupture the lining of the plaque, so-called the thin cap fibroatheroma, thicken. So you get stabilization of the lining of the plaque, it's less likely to rupture and cause a myocardial infarction. 
<clears throat> you can characterize that by invasive studies, or as I'll show you uh, in a few slides, I like to do it with CT, which is non-invasive. So you can characterize uh, plaque. The other problem with IBIS of this is it requires snaking in the catheter through the artery, and so there's a small risk of complications. And to get whole heart characterization, you need to pull the catheter out, put it in the other artery, do it three times. So major epicardial artery, so the CT is just intravenous, it's a uh, dye, you're not going in into the vascular space, and you get uh, whole heart quantification, and it is repeatable. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that. So I've been talking about LDL. Uh, one of the things I forgot to mention on this slide is uh, statins have pleiotropic effects. So they're not just reducing LDL, they're doing anti-inflammatory and other things to plaque, to stabilize it. And the best evidence of, of that comes from this recently published study last year. And we were involved with this at Rush, Dr. Williams. So we were doing CT scans on these people. So asymptomatic people with HIV who have a lot of inflammation uh, and average lipid levels, uh, and by traditional pooled cord equation, risk classification, risk score is about five. So not a particularly high-risk population, wouldn't ordinarily deserve statins, uh, aside from the fact that they have a risk enhancer of HIV. And so these investigators took pitavastatin versus placebo in these individuals with HIV. And why pitavastatin? Because it has less uh, drug-drug interactions. Um, so 7,000 people randomized, and you would expect, you know, a 17% uh, reduction in um, MACE events based on the fall in LDL that we saw with patavastatin. So it went down from 107 to 74. But surprisingly, there was a much larger effect of 35%. And the thought behind that um, is that you have not just the LDL lowering, but you have a lot of inflammation in these folks. And so the statin is not just bringing down the LDL, but folks with more inflammation, maybe that's an equally important part of the story. And patanostatin was able to reduce that inflammation quite a bit and therefore get more bang for your buck than you would have thought from the cholesterol uh, treatment uh, trialist line. And of course, there's a whole bunch of other factors. We talked about ART-induced dyslipidemia and lipodystrophy and thrombosis, and maybe statins have an effect on that too. So the story is shifting from just being LDL-centric and cholesterol-centric to what else about plaque biology that can we modify? Can we modify inflammation? Can we modify thrombosis to uh, have a benefit? I'll talk about that in a little bit. You all know this, but just to recap, how do PCSK9 inhibitors work? I talked about PCSK9 destroying LDL receptors. We block the PCSK9. You keep the LDL receptor shuttling cholesterol back and forth uh, into the cell and does that 150 times a day. So you are able to lower the LDL by blocking PCSK9. And most of you are aware of this data, very powerful data a few years ago in the New England Journal of Medicine when we took people with cardiovascular disease and gave them either abolucumab uh, or we gave them uh, uh, aluracumab, as I'll show you in the next slide, you got massive reductions in LDL, what we had not seen before, 50 to 60 milligrams per deciliter, and you got a reduction in cardiovascular events. So that was powerful information. So now these have become standard of care in people who are very high risk, and the cost has come down, and the coverage is much better. This is a, a drug that is still in trials uh, called Orion 4. This is inclycerin. And the beauty of inclycerin is it acts another way. The evolocumab, for example, the MAB means it's a monoclonal antibody. Inclycerin has SI in it, which stands for SI RNA, small interfering RNA. So what it does, it, it binds to the messenger RNA in the hepatocyte and shuts down translation of the PCSK9 protein. So inclycerin is dosed every six months. And so that's wonderful because if you have non-compliant patients, they show up in the office, they get a shot, and their cholesterol is down for the entire year. So you're not depending on the patient to take a pill every day. And this is, the outcomes data is still awaited, but it still produces about a 50% reduction in LDL. So we'll have this data next year, hopefully. I talked earlier about you know, safety signals. At the moment, we don't think very low LDLs are uh, dangerous, uh, but that data is still uh, not very long-term. We have data up to nine years. So for very high-risk patients, somebody who's had multiple MIs, multiple stents, I don't fear getting down to an LDL of three or two. Uh, you know, it depends on the risk of the patient. 
And the guidelines have simultaneously reflected that. You know, I think most of you here have practiced in an era where we used to be okay stopping at you know an LDL of 130, and now we're the goals are going lower and lower. So this is the European guidelines that say if you're very high risk, you can get down to an LDL of less than 40. And for very high risk people, such as South Asia, where I come from in India, we've you know said get down to 30. And the latest guidelines say you can even get down to 10 or 15 if you have recurrent events. Now, this is not all evidence-based. This is practice guidelines. There's some, there are a few lines of evidence, mostly observational data. Uh, but the data we've seen from sub-analyses of the PCSK9 trials show the lower the LDL, the better the benefit. So uh, we talked earlier about the multiple drugs that are uh, being used to lower LDL. So lomitopide blocks the microsomal transfer protein. It prevents ApoB binding to the particle. So you shut down AP uh, ApoB production. Inclusoran, as I mentioned, there's also oral PCSK9 molecules being studied. We talked about the ANGPTL3 blockade. There's another uh, uh, protein called APOC3, which also inhibits the function of lipoprotein lipase. And we're involved with the trial looking at olizarsin to reduce LDLs in these people. So the bottom line of this slide is, you know, it's not just statins anymore. Over the five years, there's been an explosion of drugs that we have tried to reduce cardiovascular disease risk. And CTEP inhibitors uh, were long given up for dead and not having any role, but there's some uh, interest in this drug, which I'll talk about in a little, um, uh, in, a, in a moment. So we'll do another case. Uh, is a 53-year-old woman with obesity, hypertension, diabetes. Uh, she's on a tenolol and glamipiride, was recently started on niacin for a low uh, HDL. And I think this patient came to me from an outside clinic. LDL couldn't be calculated because the triglycerides are 453. Doesn't smoke or do drugs, but the diet is poor, and she doesn't get much exercise. She's tried statins in the past and couldn't tolerate them. Um, blood pressure is, is high, 150 or 88. And she has features of heart failure. The JVP is up. She's got edema. She's got an S4. And her BNP is also up at 350. Um, Echo shows a normal ejection fraction, but grade two diastolic dysfunction with mild pulmonary hypertension. So what recommendations would I make? And this is something, some, somebody you see in clinic every day, but there's a few points here that I want to parse out and go through carefully. So number one is DC ethanol. And Dr. Williams has been on all the uh, hypertension guideline writing committees, and he will tell you that ethanol is beta blockers in general are not good drugs for blood pressure reduction and cardiovascular events. They reduce blood pressure, but don't improve cardiovascular events, especially atenolol. It's a BID drug. And so got rid of the atenolol. Diabetic with high cardiovascular risk, you really should be using RAS blockade. So put on an ACE inhibitor, maybe some FCTZ for edema. Combination therapy generally works well. There's no benefit of sulfonylureas aside from cost, cardiovascular benefit. They reduce A1C, but if it weren't for the cost, I wouldn't use them. So what would you rather use for outcomes? You'd rather use a GLP-1 receptor agonist because those have fantastic atherothrombotic reduction events, or she has HFAS, so use uh, SGLT-2. So we switched her to empagliflozin plus semaglutide, which will also help her lose, lose weight, and metformin. Aspirin, as I mentioned, unclear value unless the risk is very high. So you could do a calcium score on her and see if she needs aspirin, but you know she's very high risk anyway. So in her case, maybe you could consider it. Phenofibrate, a lot of people come to me on phenofibrate thinking it's a fantastic drug to reduce triglycerides. And Abvi did a great job, made billions of dollars in phenofibrate without any good outcomes data, right? So phenofibrate is only used for preventing pancreatitis in people with triglycerides more than 500. The triglycerides are between 200 and 500. It'll reduce the triglycerides, but it does zilch to cardiovascular risk. Even in the sub-analyses now, the data is more and more shaky. Uh, so you know, put on a low-carb, low-fat diet and get them to a dietitian. Please refer to dietary consults. They're not you know, without any benefit because they really need lifestyle optimization. In fact, we're talking about opening up a division of lifestyle medicine, which I think is great for folks like her. 
then you can consider a moderate intensity statin, but she's uh, she's got muscle aches on three of them. So we'll talk in a moment about putting on bempedoic acid. I'll talk about that. And then to calculate the LDL in folks like this, there's an app on your phone called LDL, that's what it's called, and it comes from Johns Hopkins, and it's called the Martin Hopkins formula. That's a better formula for getting a true level of LDL when the triglycerides are high. So use that instead. So use that for LDL is 121. And uh, uh, in general, I don't care about fasting lipid profiles. You get the profile when the patient's in front of you, and it really doesn't affect the LDL very much. The only time fasting is really beneficial is if you know the patient's triglycerides are going to be more than 200 or 250. And uh, as far as the low HDL, unfortunately, there's no drug at the moment that increases LDL and also benefits cardiovascular risk. Niacin was uh, a no-go. We've had a couple of trials with niacin, may even have some harm, so I stopped her niacin. So lots to parse out in this you know, relatively simple case, but important lipid concepts. I mentioned bempedoic acid. Bempedoic acid acts in the same cholesterol pathway as statins do upstream on an enzyme called ATP citrate lyase, it upregulates LDL receptors. It lowers LDL by about 20%, but also lowers CRP and maybe a little bit of A1C also. So the trials, uh, the, this trial that was reported last year with bempedoic acid in statin intolerant patients lowered cardiovascular risk and more so in people who were, who were getting it for primary prevention as a ratio of 0.68 versus those who were getting it for secondary prevention. And so it's unclear at the moment if bempedoic acid can substitute for a statin in patients who can take a statin. My first go-to is always a statin, 50 years of data, safety, remarkable uh, efficacy in reducing cardiovascular disease. But in a statin intolerant patient, it makes great sense, especially if you combine it with azetamide, then you get a 35% reduction in LDL. The side effects are it increases uric acid, cholelithiasis, and tendon rupture. Perhaps tendon rupture is not shown in the big trial, but there's some signal out there. Minor side effects, not really anything to worry about. And the reason it doesn't have statin myalgias is because it's a prodrug and it's converted to the active drug by an enzyme called very long chain acyl CoA synthetase 1, which is absent in skeletal muscle. It's present in liver, so it gets activated in the liver, but it's absent in skeletal muscle, so people don't get myalgia. So really a good choice for people who are statin intolerant. Going back to the triglyceride space, unfortunately, all the drugs you've tested in triglyceride lowering were a bust, uh, including one called Pima fibrate that we tested recently, which is a PPAR alpha blocker, which increased APOV and LDL, so phenofibrate, niacin, DHA, EPA, none of these work. But what did work is a drug called iposapentethyl, uh, which goes under the trade name Mastipa. And so this trial was in 2018 by Deepak Bhatt and all. They got people with triglycerides that were not very high, 216 at baseline. Everybody was in a statin. LDL was fantastic at 75. The CRP went down a little bit. Triglycerides went down to 175, but the benefit didn't depend on triglyceride lowering. So the drug worked, would produce a 25% reduction, massive reduction in cardiovascular events, but not because of triglyceride lowering. So I give icosapentethyl to high-risk patients, cardiovascular disease or diabetics with risk factors, but the way it works is through other mechanisms, antithrombotic and antiplatelet. So uh, fish oil derivative, icosapentethyl, anti-inflammatory, it stabilizes the membranes, it reduces sudden cardiac death by reducing ventricular arrhythmias. There may be a slight increase in AFib, but the drug works because of other mechanisms, not specifically with triglyceride lowering. So we've had many drugs that we've tested. Many of those have shown improved outcomes. Uh, we talked about statins, azetamide. The bile acid sequestrants have zero data for reduction in outcomes. Talked about PCSK9s, we talked about icosapentethyl, bempedoic acid. I mentioned this drug called obesitripib. It's a CTEP inhibitor, which uh, has to do with cholesterol transfer between HDL and LDL. And the CTEP inhibitors, this particular drug, obesitripib, it's an oral drug, reduces LDL by 
And so even though it increases HDL, the interest in it is because it reduces LDL that much and it's still in trials. We, we're actually getting ready to start that trial here. So if you have people that can't tolerate other drugs, we'll be happy to put them in some of these trials. Uh, LP little A inhibitors, we'll talk about that in a second. And drugs that didn't improve outcomes, niacin uh, and other CTEP inhibitors, et cetera. So we'll do one more case, and then I want to talk about LP little A. So this case is uh, a 27-year-old man who was referred to me by Dr. Barve and GI. He saw dermatology for rash <clears throat> and actually has a remarkable lipid profile. Triglycerides more than 10,000, cholesterol more than 1,000. And remember, uh, the total cholesterol can be high because of VLDL cholesterol. So his LDL is okay. His ApoB was okay. Um, and he has hepatomegaly, you know, lipemia retinalis. And he said, what's the diagnosis here? He's got eruptive xanthomas. And he had lipemia retinalis. This is his plasma, oh. lactose and plasma. So he has severe hypochylomicronemia. And he doesn't have FCS, which is one of the conditions that can cause this, which is familial chylomicronemia syndrome, which has a prevalence of only one in a million. But he has something called multifactorial chylomicronemia. And the risk of pancreatitis goes up if your triglycerides are more than 500. And the risk of ASCVD is mostly in the 200 to 800 space. Beyond that, it's mostly pancreatitis. So we put him on a very low fat diet. He didn't know he was diabetic, but his A1C was 11%. We sent him to a dietitian, put him on insulin. And so if you look at the prevalence of high triglycerides, 40 million Americans have it. Most of them are in this range that you see in clinic. Very rare to have triglycerides more than 500. Only 1.7% of people have that. And there's a 4% increased risk of pancreatitis every time your triglycerides go up by more than 100 the odds ratio for coronary disease increase once your triglycerides start going up, uh, but mostly between the 200 and 800 space, like I said. Now, most people who have high triglycerides, it's because they have a small sprinkling of bad effects from all these genes that are listed there. So this particular individual had what I call polygenic uh, multifactorial chylomicronemia. So he's got these you know, 15 genes. And if you have a conglomeration of genes that are not functioning well, but in small doses, that's multigenic, as opposed to monogenic, which is familial chylomicronemia, where one of these genes is knocked off completely. So remember I was talking about LPL earlier, lipoprotein lipase that hydrolyzes triglycerides? If that's not working, your triglycerides are going to be 15,000, 50,000, but from infancy. Those folks can't even have half a hot dog before landing up in the hospital with pancreatitis. They have one beer and they're in the hospital with pancreatitis. Thankfully, it's very rare. And there are drugs being tested for it uh, that, as I mentioned, APOC3 blockers that will help this condition. So APOC3 blockers, these are two trials going on here. Uh, one of them is called IONIS. The other one's called NSD. As I said, APOC3 inhibits LPL and it reduces... Uh, uh, LDL, it reduces VLDL, ApoB, and increases HDL. You can't ask for a better profile. And so there's a couple of trials that we're doing in people with high triglycerides and high ASCVD rest. The other trial that we're doing is this, with this compound, which is a, a EPA derivative, icosapent, uh, uh, pentaenoic acid, which is a fish oil molecule, again, for people with severe hypertriglyceridemia. So we have another case that Dr. Rafi Khan actually sent me. The 47-year-old chiropractor goes to the ER for chest pain. He gets transient ST elevation, emergently transferred to a cath lab. Uh, it's a mid-RCS stenosis that uh, had a beautiful result angiographically after he put in a stent. So, and uh, he was sent to me because he's young and he has no other risk factors. LDL is 50, no family history, non-smoker. And why is there a discrepancy between his LDL and ApoB? Remember what I said earlier? Some cholesterol is carried by LP little a. LP little a has an ApoB molecule on it. And high LPA is uh, one of the things that causes premature cardiovascular disease. So um, the CV risk starts going up at 30 milligrams per deciliter or 75 nanomoles per liter. We like to use nanomoles per liter, which is a more standardized way of measuring it. And the US guidelines recommend checking it for either family or personal history of premature cardiovascular disease 
um, the uh, European guidelines say check it for everyone once in their lifetime. It doesn't really change with diet or exercise. All you need to do is check it once. Uh, or unless they're on a drug and it's going down with that, then you can check it more often. So we put them in a trial that's reducing LP little A called uh, uh, Olpasaran. And uh, uh, high LPA is found in 20% of people in the U.S. And now there's all these drugs. Uh, we put them in this trial with a small interfering RNA that blocks the production of uh, LP little A. Well, Pastor and that's looking at cardiovascular outcomes. The trial that is ongoing that we actually did at Rush was Pella Carson uh, that reduces LP little 80%. And that trial will report next year as to whether or not you can reduce cardiovascular risk. LP little is more atherogenic uh, than LDL. Uh, the hazard ratio is higher than having a high LDL. The good news is that the PCFK9 inhibitors also lower LP level A. Statins do not. But if you have somebody with a high LP level A, your only two options until these trials report out is aphoresis, which is actually approved by Medicare. But it's hard to have somebody come in for aphoresis for high LP level A. But uh, most of the times, I just put them on a PCFK9. Talked about residual risk from inflammation. I want to mention. There's a lot of work going on in not lowering LDL, but reducing inflammation. This trial, Canto studied canicunumab, doesn't affect LDL, but had improved events if your CRP was up. And inflammation acts via the inflammasome. If your CRP is up, you have a better reduction in cardiovascular death from using uh, uh, drugs such as statins or the uh, anti-inflammatory drugs. So, Colchicine is also being investigated in that space, um, mostly in secondary prevention, but now also in primary prevention. I'm going to skip this slide that was sent to me by Dr. Uh, Joflin for a very, very high cholesterol. And this is a condition called LPX that causes eruptive xanthomas. And we actually reported this case, uh, not seen very commonly, but if you have people with liver disease, uh, and very high cholesterol, think of LPX. In the interest of time, I'm gonna skip some of these slides because I know we wanna take questions. And so I uh, do wanna put in a plug here for a trial we're doing. We talked a lot about starting treatment early, but in order to do that, you have to identify people early. So we're doing a trial in people who have non-obstructive disease on CT and risk factors and things like South Asian or hypertension or family history will receive the CT and then we'll randomize them to statin for guideline uh, or statin plus these other drugs I talked about, colchicine, uh, inclisiran, bempedoic acid. And it's a prospective open label blinded endpoint trial. After 18 months, we'll repeat the CT to see if there's plaque regression. You do actually see plaque regression when people have are treated with anti-lipid and anti-inflammatory drug. You see this plaque here is getting smaller. And what really gets smaller is a low attenuation lipid-rich plaque. Uh, and we'll also look at inflammatory biomarkers. I'm doing this uh, trial with drugs. Dr. William is doing a similar trial called disparity with diet, uh, with a vegan diet. And so it'll be really interesting to show if you can modify disease by uh, these drugs and by diet. And you got to start training them early. Congratulations, <laughs> Dr. Gower. That was that was an amazing masterclass on uh, lipidology and lipid management. Uh, let me uh, a couple of things you said have been of interest to me uh, in that when you're you're treating with statins, but that's not the only tool in the toolbox, as you mentioned. Uh, and you also mentioned the fact that we have a couple of other risk factors that we're not always measuring, uh, particularly the high sensitivity C-reactive protein, the number of times I see that measured with people, uh, and also LP little a. Um, but not just how do you get people to start measuring them, but the other issue is when they're elevated. Uh, which do you feel would be the stronger? Well, that, I'm, there may be evidence out there that I'm not aware of, which is, is more impactful. Obviously, Paul Richter is going to say it's, it's inflammation. And obviously, that you know goes with all the you know, vegan diet people because it's one of the things that lowers both LDL and inflammation, but not so much. There's a small effect on PCSK9. So if, you're, if you've got if your statin, that'll work on the LDL 
but not uh, LP little a. Correct. But it will decrease uh, inflammation. But then you've got a PCSK9 that will dramatically lower your LDL and it'll lower your LP little a. Correct. But it won't, it'll lower inter, uh, uh, LDL I mean, or um, PRP. PRP. So, which do you think is the most powerful? Uh, uh, which, if we, if we can only do two out of the three, which one would you go for? Yeah, that's a great question. So the question is, you know, what is the interaction of LDL, LP little a, inflammation, which is more important? I think it depends in part on which is the more predominant condition in the patient in front of you. So if I have diabetics and smokers, I know they have a lot more inflammation. Uh, LP little a is very pro-inflammatory and very pro clogging uh, and if I don't have diabetes, uh, smoking, and just a very high LDL and a mildly elevated CRP, I know my statin alone will do that. So I, I look at the patient and see what in this individual is more likely to be the case. Because all we're doing with inflammation is just measuring one marker, which is CRP. There's many other markers we're not measuring. I know we have, we're trying to in our study with TNF uh, and MPO. And that's, that's the thing though. Yeah. Okay, so we'll just uh, if, somebody, somebody, oh, if, you can quit, if you can go back on mute. Okay, okay. thank you. So, yeah, getting back to your question. So, then I, I see which person has more of an inflammatory risk. If the LPA is high, as I showed, the risk is disproportionately high, most of it driven by inflammation and cholesterol. So, at the moment, I'll either put them in a trial or a PCSK. Yeah. Uh, if it's not high, then I tend to go for IPE, icosapent ethyl, uh, because it just remarkably reduces the uh, percentage reduction in endpoints is so high. Um, and then if they're, you know, if they have um, high triglycerides, also again I'll use IPE. Um, the, most of the things these days are in the trial space, so I'll try to enroll them in a particular trial for that. Uh, either one of the LP little A trials or the APOC3 trials, etc. But at the moment, there's not much you can do aside from increasing the stores of statin to max possible and adding a PCSK9 and maybe IPE. Fantastic. And, and benpedoic acid also, by the way, reduces uh, uh, CRP. So that's all CRP. anti inflammatory. So that's another tool in your armamentary. Right. CRP would not help you the way. Right. So there's a couple of questions in the yeah. chat area. One is actually from Dr. Frisch. Uh, said, one, said, what are the thoughts on lipid reduction and statins for anti-aging and dementia? I uh, said, our VA is one of the sites for preventable, say, statin for an over 75-year-old primary prevention, dementia, and other aspects of aging. Yeah, that's a great question. People have actually looked at this from both standpoints. One is, initially, there was a concern that actually statins may drive dementia. And then it became clear that statins are actually magical pills in the water, they not only reduce dementia by small percentage, not a lot, mostly because of reduction in vascular events. So, you know, some dementias have a vascular component, or in fact, a lot of them do, right? So uh, if it reduces that vascular uh, events, small infarcts, that reduces dementia from that aspect. It also improves endothelial function, which may have something to do with it, uh, but also redu reduces some sorts of cancers, there's a small signal in that. So there's a lot of reductions and no harms really, aside from in the vascular brain space, I should sort of say that very high dose intensity statins cause a mild increase in hemorrhagic stroke. Um, but when you look at large population data sets, such as the CTT, which has over 250,000 patients, there's a small decrement in dementia, not an increase. So that's how the whole process had started. Is there an increase in death, cancer, CKD, dementia? Most of the signals are one to five percent less. So question for you from the standpoint of a primary care physician. Um, I think I consider ourselves sort of the first responders to hyperlipidemia. And even though I've referred a lot of patients to you, I have many, many more <laughs> who have not been referred and we're trying our best. Um, and so I really struggle with the folks in their 20s, 30s, and early 40s. Um, for him, I feel like perhaps the guidelines have not yet caught up to this concept of cholesterol years. 
Um, and so I find myself more and more having shared decision making conversations with, you know, folks who are not an extreme example. You know, I don't feel like I need to go straight to genetic testing or refer to you for that. Um, but I know I'm letting them walk around for 25 years with an LDL of 160. Yeah. And obviously we talk about lifestyle changes, but um, but I find myself departing from guidelines more and more in terms of offering people the choice of being on a statin. So I wondered if you could comment on how you would recommend approaching that population and also whether we should expect guidelines to change yeah. along those lines. Fantastic question. As, as you mentioned, there's a tsunami of patients out there. And the more we realize when we have to start, the more we see we should be able to offer, but it's not yet in the guidelines. So I'll tell you my approach. 160 and over actually qualifies as a risk enhancer for LDL. So there you could, you would actually be within the confines of the guidelines to discuss the statin with them and start it. But I see a lot of people with an LDL of 120 and all they have is a family history. So I always check LDL and I always check CRP as Dr. Williams mentioned. And if everything comes back negative, thankfully we do have people who are working in the space. I work in the imaging space. You could consider a coronary invasive CTA because at age 25, the chance that they have calcium is so small that your calcium score is likely to be zero. We're looking for non-calcified small plaque with a you know with coronary CTA. But again, that's in the research realm. That's where studies such as this will inform the space. The one other thing you can do at the moment is something called a polygenic risk score which is uh, scores that are derived from massive data banks, such as the UK uh, Biobank, which has half a million people. And investigators have taken SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, from this massive data bank and correlated gene polymorphisms in a, a cluster of maybe 100 genes with the event rates for cardiovascular disease. And they've identified you look at these particular SNPs and this panel of genes, it increases your risk of cardiovascular disease by say 10% or 20%. So that's one aspect that is now in the commercial space. Again, the data is not prospective that if you find these people with a high polygenic risk, treat them, you're actually making a difference. Intuitively, it makes sense it would uh, because of the biology. So that's what I do at the moment. I, I, may offer them uh, you know, shared decision-making with just start a statin now and we'll see. Uh, after age 30, I generally feel more comfortable doing coronary CTAs. In the 20 to 30 space, I still look for other reasons, um, other uh, biomarkers, other things I can find. Uh, I would consider a polygenic risk score. And of course, then the basic underpinnings is lifestyle changes, right? We know that people have, you know, the life, healthy eight. They look at folks who develop coronary disease, they will have four or five um, lifestyle factors that are not optimal. So first, I always start with that. Then the safety of statin allows me to go to statins if I could feel they're high risk. And then, of course, we get into these research areas. But you're right. I think the guidelines will change informed by studies like ours, where you show you pick up non-obstructive plaque that is sort of benign, whether in the coronaries or iliofemorals, Put people on a statin, you're actually modifying events. Those trials are ongoing too. Fantastic talk. So uh, one comment and one question. Uh, with In Epic, I uh, just commented that there is a lipid order with direct LDL reflex. So I suggest people use that. Most of you probably do that. So if your uh, triglycerides tri elevated, they directly, they give you an LDL direct measurement. Um, so the um, question is, the pancreatitis, I've always thought that the 500 is too low. I've never seen anything, any pancreatitis with triglyceride less than, I don't know, 2000. <clears throat> so I feel like we end up having a lot of people on phenofibrate um, just because we're too timid about triglyceride. So I want to see your comment. Your, what's your opinion on that? Yeah. I mean, you, you're right in general that the risk goes up and it's not a linear risk. So there are some idiosyncratic cases. I've seen cases of 600 with pancreatitis, but they probably have some prior destruction of pancreatic acinar tissue and the ducts. So in general, you're right. Um, but the reason I put them on phenofibrate is, you remember triglycerides are very dynamic. So somebody shows up in your clinic fasting, gets a triglycerides of 550, 
that person may then go to a birthday party four days from now and postprandial their triglycerides may be 2,500. So I think what I'm trying to do by putting them on female fiber is prevent those sort of excursions, which can lead to pancreatitis until I get all of their risk factors mitigated. Most of the times, as I see, it's poor diabetic control, lots of carbohydrate intake, lots of saturated fat intake. So once you get those factors under control and put them on an appropriate anti-diabetic therapy, then you can generally get their triglycerides under 500 and stop the phenofibrate if need be, put them on iposapentethyl. Um, but it's mostly to prevent that very small risk. That's all right, though. Really a phenomenal talk. Um, I have a lot of patients who re read Outlive by Dr. Peter Zia, and then they come in once their A4B checked, which obviously is very reasonable, but they're not so much concerned about the LDL anymore. <laughs> how do you counsel these patients? Um, how often do you check in clinical practice? How do you treat? What's your level? Yeah, that's a great question. So if you look at uh, the science behind A4B, remember every atherogenic particle has an A4B. Uh, whether it's carlomicron remnants or VLDL remnants, IDL remnants, or LDL. So you're actually getting a more comprehensive picture of the atherogenic potential by checking ApoB. Let me give you an example. You have somebody with an LDL cholesterol of um, 140, and their LDL particle number may be very high if they have small dense LDL or very low if they have large LDL. The risk is higher in the person who has more particle numbers because there's more ApoB containing particles to penetrate the subendothelial space. So there are discrepant conditions, especially in people with metabolic syndrome, obesity, where we're underestimating risk by measuring only LDL. Mm -hmm. There, the risk is better predicted by ApoB. Second, ApoB is more standardized and more predictive of risk, even after you control for LDL. So that, that's an important concept. The reason we haven't done it is because folks say it's a little bit extra cost, all these things. There's a gentleman who's uh, very well known in the space, Alan Snyderman, who talks about ApoB, and there's a big push in the scientific community to measure ApoB because it's a better risk predictor. Others argue, you know, you get the same information by non-HDL, HDL, which is available on the lipid panel, so use that first. And then if you have need to clarify further, which occurs in about less than 5% of patients, then you can get an ApoB. I tend to measure ApoB if I have extremes. So metabolic syndrome, obesity, LDL less than 30, where I need more quantification of risk. And that's also the same time I measure advanced lipid parameters, such as particle number and size and so on. Vast majority of patients, you get information by non-HDL, LDL, ApoA, uh, and so select circumstances, you may need ApoB, but I think the push is worldwide to start incorporating that because it's easy, it's doable, it's more standardized. Maybe one more from the chat area from uh, Dr. Robert Emmons in our bone marrow transplant group. Let's know, can you comment on the increased use of semaglutide and similar drugs and how this affects your recommendations? Uh, in, in what conditions? Semaglutide? Just say SCVD or? I guess, yeah. The, yeah. Just in general, yeah. I suppose. So they, these are wonder drugs. Um, obviously, they're anti-diabetic drugs, but they also reduce plaque inflammation, low attenuation plaque. There's early data on that, not in humans, but in animal models. Uh, they produce atrothrombotic events. We've seen that. And now they also reduce HFF. <laughs> so they're great for obesity, great for diabetes, great for atrostatic cardiovascular disease. The only issue I have with that is, you know, the focus uh, nationwide has become drug as a problem, for, uh, drug as a solution for a problem. And I wish the focus were more on let's do lifestyle and other things first, which have as much of a benefit, and then resort to drugs only in the folks who need them. Obviously, the cost is one issue, uh, but, you know, it's like the Prozac nation, now it's become the Ozempic nation, right? So it's just, I think the focus should be on all of those other foundational elements first, and then reaching for these drugs. But yeah, and people who need them, they do have uh, wonderful benefits for, you know, all the diseases I mentioned, plus CKD for SGLT2 and uh, GLP1. So there's a lot we still have to discover, discover about their biology, but I would definitely use them when needed.
Well, this has been really fantastic. You get the uh, award for the longest screen round <laughs> ever. Uh, but well, well, very well uh, taken by everyone. The, the intensity and uh, the attention uh, was fantastic. And uh, we really appreciate all the uh, the learning this morning. And uh, you many will uh, hopefully not reject us because we went 75 minutes instead of 60. Um, but I'm hoping that uh, this will, this will get uh, on Louisville lectures and everyone will actually get to to benefit from it. So thank you so much. Thank you.